Hey guys, Mr. Nichols here to talk to you a little bit about our new concept, which is kind of building off of what we already talked about last week with uh, individual versus class evidence. Those were our two, two big groups of evidence that we had talked about already. Uh, so not this week, but next week, we will be doing an in-lab activity when we will be talking about the different types of evidence. So um, our in-person activity or our mock activity for this week is to learn about the uh, case of the O.J. Simpson murder trial. And what I'd like you guys to be keying in on is look for these particular types of evidence and try and pick out from that video what, uh, what types of evidence they're, the ones that are brought up in the video are examples of. So today we're going to be talking about more specifically what are the different types of evidence uh, beyond individual versus class evidence. So this is a great opportunity for us to talk about uh, Lacard's exchange principle. So if you remember correctly, uh, early in this semester we had talked about uh, different forensic scientists, and one of the most famous is Edmund Lacard. So Edmund Lacard's exchange principle states that whenever two objects come in contact with each other, there's going to be some sort of transfer that happens. So physical evidence is going to be left on both of those objects. Now, if we think about this, this is the exact same thing as if someone has soil on their shoes and they walk through a classroom. Or if you're uh, sitting in a room and you have fibers on your clothes. As you sit down and stand up, you're going to leave some of those small fibers, even if they're microscopic, even if they're very small, there's going to be some sort of evidence, some sort of trace left behind that you were there. So it's the job of a forensic analyst to find those pieces of evidence, whether they're microscopic or macro, if they're very large. So the amount of evidence that's left behind is going to be dependent on a couple different factors. So the intensity of the contact or the interaction with that space. Uh, if someone uh, basically was just walking through a room, that's going to be a very low intense, uh, low intensity action that's happening there. But if they're walking through there and they're flipping tables and they're jumping around and they're running laps around there, if there's a lot of motion, if there's a lot of connection, a lot more uh, contact that's happening, there's going to be a lot more um, evidence left behind. So also duration. So how long you're in that space. Are you quickly just running through a room or are you going to be staying there for a long period of time? And then also the nature of the contact as well. So just by design, if you touch a surface really quickly with your hand or if you touch that surface and then drag your hand across that surface, uh, the nature of that dragging contact is going to leave much more evidence behind. So that's going to determine the extent at which the amount of evidence that's left behind is indicated. So a couple broad categories of types of evidence. So first thing, you've probably heard of this term, and it's a little bit difficult for us to define. We're going to try and define it a little bit further today. Uh, so our first type of evidence is circumstantial evidence. So then we have demonstrative evidence, direct evidence, and then physical evidence. Now, the vast majority of our efforts in this class are going to be focused on looking at physical evidence, but we do need to have at least a baseline understanding of these other ones. So first off, looking at circumstantial evidence. So basically, circumstantial evidence is evidence that does not directly imply a conclusion. Basically, you need another piece of information. You need another piece of evidence to uh, infer that that uh, statement that that circumstantial evidence is making is correct. So it's up to the judge or the jury, what we call a trier of fact, to determine whether or not uh, the conclusion put on by the prosecution or the defense was in fact the case. So let's take a look at an example here. So hopefully this kind of helps uh, clear this up a little bit. So let's say we've got Cookie Monster and Cookie Monster is found standing by an open cookie jar with crumbs all over his face. So the fact that he has crumbs on his face and he was seen by the cookie jar means that he most likely ate that cookie. No one actually saw him 
We don't have any direct evidence that he ate the cookie, but we can infer that he most likely was the person that ate the cookies out of the jar. So there's no evidence directly connecting him. It requires an inference or a guess. It requires you to think about uh, making a conclusion there. So that's by, def by definition what circumstantial evidence is. So demonstrative evidence is going to be uh, evidence that's used to oftentimes supplement either a prosecution or a defense. So it's oftentimes used by uh, lawyers and attorneys. Um, it's, it's usually to help a judge or a jury visualize what happened at a particular crime scene. So these can be things like maps, drawings, sketches of the actual crime scene, um, uh, photographs to help them, uh, to help the judge and the jury visualize what happened at that particular crime scene. To be honest, this is the one that we're going to focus on the least in here. Okay. All right. So uh, an example of demonstrative evidence would be that if someone drew a map of the kitchen showing uh, how close Cookie Monster was to that cookie jar. That's an example of demonstrative. Again, that's the one we're going to cover the least. <clears throat> so this, this uh, type of evidence we've actually taught, spent some time talking about earlier this semester. So direct is another way of saying testimonial evidence. So basically someone's firsthand account of what particularly happened. So these can be uh, eyewitness accounts. So someone who might have seen someone running away from a crime scene. Um, these could also include confessions and also video evidence if there's uh, a security camera that caught someone um, uh, fleeing a crime scene or robbing a bank. So testimonial evidence does not require additional inference. It's just what it is. So um, a term that we should at least have a baseline understanding of is hearsay. So hearsay is basically someone who is repeating another person's statement. So it's kind of like a secondary uh, testimony. So, I mean, someone is uh, repeating what they had seen a witness do or heard a witness say. That's an example of hearsay. And usually it's going to be inadmissible in court, meaning that it cannot be used in a courtroom. So let's say, for example, that <clears throat> someone actually sees Cookie Monster eat a cookie out of the cookie jar. That means that uh, if you believe that person's testimony, there is no room for inference. You either believe what they said and that it's true, or you don't believe that person's account and you would say that that's not true then. So there's really no gray area in between. Whereas uh, with circumstantial evidence, there would be. So it's either if you see someone do something or you don't. Okay. So then we finally have physical or indirect evidence. So this is going to be uh, the vast majority of the types of evidence that we'll talk about here this semester. So this is going to be things like um, blood spatter, tool marks, fingerprints, um, uh, skin or other types of cells that are found, uh, other bodily fluids that might have DNA inside of them. These are all examples of physical evidence, meaning that there's no opinion being shared here. There's not any inference. It's just what the evidence is. Okay. All right. So a couple of big myths that we should definitely address before we move on, uh, which you might need to pause this and, and jot some of these down. <clears throat> so the first myth is that you can't convict someone just on circumstantial evidence, meaning that you can't just convict someone on inference. That is not true. So you can absolutely convict someone based just on circumstantial evidence. Oftentimes, there's not going to be someone who sees someone commit a crime, or uh, there's not going to be clear-cut evidence directly connecting someone to a crime. Oftentimes, we need to make probable conclusions and the best conclusions we can based on the evidence that we have. But there is no legal distinction between direct and circumstantial evidence, between eyewitness testimony and that physical evidence there. It's up to the trier of fact to determine uh, uh, how much weight or basically how much they trust that evidence there. Okay. So we also have... Uh, if we think about another common myth, is that 
uh, direct evidence, meaning if someone sees a crime take place, that that's more reliable than physical evidence. Remember what we talked about earlier this semester with eyewitness testimony. So eyewitness testimony is actually one of the weakest forms of evidence in a case because of how malleable human memory is. It's very difficult for us to clearly remember all the details of a particular event. So um, as we talked about before, physical evidence is going to be much stronger than eyewitness testimony. However, there are many cases that are decided purely on eyewitness testimony, and unfortunately that leads to many miscarriages of justice uh, throughout our country. And not to mention the fact that people can lie. So people have motivations, people might be trying to protect someone. So it's entirely possible that people might lie, even if they're under oath. So we have to keep that in mind there. And lastly, for physical evidence, yes, you can look at a lot of these and some of these we already mentioned, but the strength of physical evidence is that it can connect someone to a crime scene, whether it's a fingerprint, fingerprint or um, a hair follicle or a shoe print. So those types of physical evidence are all going to connect people to a particular crime scene, to our narrative uh, when we're trying to reconstruct that there. Okay. So now that we've talked about our general categories, okay, we've got circumstantial, direct or testimonial evidence, and demonstrative evidence here. So if we look at the different types of physical evidence, as we mentioned, these are the ones we're going to be focusing on mostly for the semester. So we've got five main different categories. We've got transient, pattern, conditional, transfer, and associative. So we're gonna go through each of these in a little bit more detail, but I would recommend maybe pausing the video and then uh, jotting these uh, definitions down here. Okay. So transient evidence is evidence that's going to change pretty quickly. So oftentimes this is uh, first identified by the person, the first person who processes that crime scene, who arrives at the crime scene. So these are going to be things like a particular smell. Because of the nature of smell, it, the scents can disappear very easily. Um, things like temperature, okay, determining uh, what the temperature was inside of an apartment where someone was killed. Uh, so we can determine uh, what the temperature was of the uh, that area so we can determine the decomposition of that uh, dead body. Um, so <clears throat> these are going to be things also like uh, if how, how recent a, a crime took place. So if you have a, a bathtub and it's full of hot water, chances are that crime took place relatively recently. Okay, And also um, uh, impressions that are in uh, objects that can change. So things like uh, footprints in sand. Okay. So over time, that footprint is going to erode away. So uh, tire marks on things like a dirt road, for example, if it rains, that tire mark is going to change. So basically transient means that it's going to change at some point in a short period of time. So that would be transient. So then we have pattern. To be honest, pattern, I have some students uh, mix that up with transfer. Uh, pattern, when we think about it, that's going to be mostly when you're looking at physical contact between uh, a person and an object or two objects together. So these are going to be things like tire tracks, glass fracture, paint matching, paint chip matching, um, fire burn patterns. Um, and, and one that I think we could kind of fit into two categories would be fingerprints. I would, I would argue that we could justify that a fingerprint is a type of pattern although it does also fit into our transfer category as well. So tire marks would be a great example of a pattern. You have the physical contact between the, the surface and the tread of the tire. So we could also kind of expand this out and also look at uh, so modus operandi, which basically, which stands for, MO stands for modus operandi. That basically means how someone commits a crime. And if there's a pattern in how they commit a crime over and over and over again, things like calling cards for serial killers, um, that would be an example of a pattern as well. Okay. So then we also have conditional evidence. So conditional evidence is going to be based on the conditions of the crime scene. What was the uh, the lights, were the lights on in an apartment when the door was swung open and police 
entered the area? Uh, were the headlights left on in a car of someone who was uh, murdered, for example? <clears throat> so uh, these are going to be also things with like fire. You could look at the color of fire to determine how hot it is, or maybe what are some of the chemicals that were present inside of it? How quickly did it spread throughout an area? Okay. We could also look at things like location. So how, um, how stab wounds on a victim were found? Where were they located on the body? Also, what was the layout of the room like? So if we had uh, uh, some tables and chairs that were flipped over or windows that were left open, that's going to be examples of conditional because that's the condition of that crime scene. So in a car, was the, were the doors locked or unlocked? Was What was the mileage of a particular car? Uh, so we could look at things like body. As we just mentioned with the wounds, uh, what stage of decomposition is that body in? Okay. And again, we had talked about <clears throat> the scene. So looking at, you know, were there doors that were flung open? Were there drawers that were pulled out? Uh, were there signs of a struggle? Things like that would be examples of conditional evidence. Okay. So again, as I mentioned, transfer is commonly mixed up with uh, pattern with uh, fingerprints. I would say that transfer would be a, a better example, or sorry, fingerprints would be a better example of transfer than they would for pattern, but I would accept either as a, as an op, as a correct answer. So <clears throat> transfer evidence basically means contact between a person and an object or two persons. So for example, you can see on this bowl here, the person's hand is touching the outside of that little bowl and it's leaving a fingerprint behind. That's from physical contact from a person to an object. So this could also be things like hair or fibers that are left on a victim from uh, a suspect. Or if we have defensive wounds that are um, on a suspect from the victim. So those would be examples, <clears throat> excuse me, those would be examples of transfer evidence. And then finally, we have associative evidence. So associative evidence is basically looking at someone's physical property. Is there any one person who uh, an item can be connected to? So this would be things like in a, in a mugging, if someone is caught later on with a wallet or a cell phone or a a debit card or a credit card that specifically belongs to that one person. It can be traced to that one person. That's going to be an example of associative evidence, belongings or someone's property there. So let's kind of, now that we've gone through all of those different categories, let's kind of put all of this together here. So if we think about it, evidence is divided into three broad categories. So we have direct, which that means uh, testimonial, first-hand accounts, that's going to be video evidence. Circumstantial, which remember that needs to be, um, that does not have its own conclusions drawn. Instead, we have to infer what circumstantial evidence means for a case. And then we also have demonstrative. So demonstrative, again, with those charts and maps that are oftentimes just used in court. So physical evidence is actually a type of circumstantial evidence because it requires an inference. If you find a fingerprint in a crime scene, you need to infer that someone was present at the crime scene. So <clears throat> remember our examples of physical evidence are gonna be pattern, associative, transient, transfer, and conditional. So now that we've talked about all of these different categories, now let's go ahead and break out into some practice. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at what we're gonna be doing here today for our uh, types of evidence, types of physical evidence uh, activity. So on the first side or the first page, the first section, you guys are gonna be trying to figure out how you would properly store this particular type of evidence. And I'd like you to explain why you would pick that type of storage. So remember, we basically have four different options, okay? So first, we have a plastic bag. So that's gonna be for most larger objects that aren't gonna be damaged and it doesn't have any biological evidence on it. Two, we have the small plastic pill container. So the small plastic pill container is gonna be for anything, again, that doesn't have biological evidence on it, anything that's small and anything that might break or be fragile, that might be damaged while traveling to the crime lab. 
Three, we have the paper bag. So anything that is biological evidence needs to be first dried and then stored in a paper bag. Okay, so we, that's going to prevent the development of mold and uh, bacterial uh, contamination. And then lastly, we have uh, a metal container. So basically an airtight metal container is gonna be for any liquids. And oftentimes that's gonna be for flammable liquids that'll evaporate very easily. So that's what you're gonna be doing for this first section here, which uh, you'll go ahead and just fill that out for each of these different examples here. So then for the second part, you're picking out what examples of, from each of these uh, different scenarios, which of them is an example of transient, conditional, pattern, transfer, and associative. So for each of these four scenarios, you're going to need to list at least three of these different types of evidence, and you're going to need to show why you think that it's that particular type of evidence. So let's look at uh, just really quickly this first one here for an example. Okay, so at 9 p.m. on August 23rd of 2004, police investigators arrived at the scene of a possible arson. While doing a walkthrough of the crime scene, the investigators noticed the aroma of gasoline. So right there, the aroma of gasoline, that's going to be an example of transient evidence because the smell is going to disappear very quickly, that odor. You could also say that that would be an example of conditional evidence. I would accept that as well which there are some of these that we can answer multiple questions or answer, have multiple answers and have it be correct. But there are definitely some that wouldn't fit into those categories. So that would be that you could use that as your first example for number one. You'll need to come up with two more for number one there. Okay, so I hope that that makes sense. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Mr. Scott or to reach out to me through Remind. I'd be happy to help you guys out. So thank you guys for sticking around. I know this was a little bit long, but I hope it was, uh, it hope, hopefully it helped you figure out what some of these different types of evidence are. So hope you guys enjoy the rest of your week. Good to see you and take care. Bye-bye.